Good evening, everyone. My name is Adam Yellen, and I'm an actor, director, and administrative associate for the Jewish Repertory Theater. Thank you so, so much for joining us tonight for the third in a series of five conversations we are having with our playwrights for our digital season this year. Tonight, we are so very lucky to have the Year My Mother Came Back playwright, Alice Eve Cohen with us, as well as director of our virtual staged reading of that production, Josie DiVincenzo. We are so honored to have these amazing artists joining us again this season after last season's extremely successful production of What I Thought I Knew, also written by Alice Eve Cohen and starring Josie DiVincenzo. Here is a little more information on Alice. Alice Eve Cohen, playwright and solo theater artist is the winner of the 2019 Jane Chambers Playwriting Award, award-winning author of two memoirs, The Year My Mother Came Back and What I Thought I Knew, winner of the Elle Magazine Literary Grand Prix for nonfiction, Oprah Magazine's 25 Best Books of the Summer, and Salon's Best Books of the Year. She is an MFA playwriting mentor at Augsburg's University University's Creative Writing MFA program and teaches undergraduate playwriting and creative writing at the new school where she received the 2020 Distinguished Teaching Award. And if you have followed Jewish repertory theater at all, you will know Josie DiVincenzo, who is one of the most prominent and well-respected theater artists in Buffalo. She has appeared in various film and TV projects as well. At the JRT, she has been most notably seen in My Name is Asher Lev. Uh, the one woman show Die, for which she won an Artie Award for Best Leading Actress in a Play. And as mentioned before, last season's What I Thought I Knew, for which she is currently nominated for an Artie Award once again for Best Leading Actress in a Play. We are honored to have her back this season directing this production for us for the first time. Just one note before we get into it, if you are watching live on YouTube right now and you have any questions, please type them into the YouTube comment section for a short Q&A at the end of the program. And what? And uh, the year my mother came back will be running or streaming, should I say, from February 4th to the 24th. And any information you would like on tickets, you can visit theater.com. So without further ado, I am honored to introduce Alice Eve Cohen and Josie DiVincenzo. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, hey, Josie. Alice. Hey. <laughs> and hello, everybody who's here with us tonight. Uh, this is so exciting. You know, we're in our homes, but it still feels very live. And I know you're all out there. So um, Wow, uh, it's it's my incredible pleasure to be here tonight. And um, we thought we would just have a conversation as Alice and I have been doing uh, for a year now, now and then because we've been working together, right, Alice? Oh my gosh, it is such a joy to be collaborating with you. It was just about exactly a year ago that we met each other at the opening night of what I thought I knew. It was the beginning of my total love affair with the Jewish Repertory Theater. Um, I'm so delighted to be involved with the JRT. I, I was, um, I visited for a few days, we got to know each other. And since then, since seeing your magnificent tour de force performance of what I thought I knew, my 40 character solo play. Um, <laughs> thank you for tackling that. <laughs> Beautifully directed um, yes. by Saul Elkin. Um, but since then, we have become friends and Facebook friends. In fact, oh, goodness, the, the show closed at the end of February, of course, right before everything closed down with COVID. Before that, you we were on the phone and you, you said, I'd love to see you when I come to New York City next week. Yeah. That didn't happen. Right. But we've 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 kept in touch. You've been a, a Facebook friend and it's been this kind of hilarious meta uh, relationship <laughs> because you have now played every member of my family. You've played me. And so anytime I post anything about one of my daughters, you you respond uh, with a degree of identification that always cracks me up that I always have to share with my daughters, my husband, everybody. I think it's so funny and well, it very is so sweet. Fun because I feel proud when I have no reason to. I these are not my, you know, children and husband. And I also <laughs> feel, you know, um uh like responsible in some way. Like I'm 
Julia, Julia with her achievements or Eliana or whatever. Uh, it is, it was such a connection to dive into someone's family. I mean, for those of you that, that didn't get a chance to see it last year, what I thought I knew is the real life harrowing, and I don't say that lightly, tumultuous, challenging, hard experience of Alice with a late, you know, and later in life, if you will, pregnancy that she was not aware was brewing inside of her until very late. And all the things, Alice, that you went through, you know, in portraying someone like that, uh, th there's a lot of imagination we must use as actors, as actors, along with our own experiences. But when you're playing someone real, who comes to opening night, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> Um, in a way, it was so great as an actor to work on it that way and have you opening night because I thought, you know what, I can't worry about anything but telling the story right now. I, I can't. But, you know, you're a live, real person still here. You know, it's not like I was portraying Eleanor Roosevelt or something and could have watched films on someone. But, I, but the way you wrote it was so personal that it was easy to imagine, you know, your daughters and your husband and you. Um, and oh my gosh, all the amazing characters that went through this journey with you. So, well, yeah. one of the things I, I loved so much about your performance, and I think this is um, this is equally relevant to you, the production you're directing of the year my mother came back. So, um, you know, both these plays are excuse me for this um, visual aid adaptations of my two memoirs. So <laughs> last year you did uh, about I guess. Uh, about eight years ago, I adapted uh, What I Thought I Knew, which you performed, deeply personal subject. Um, however, you made all of the characters individuals who were so specific and so believable and not me. They were, you created an Alice who was an every woman. Mm. And it was a beautiful, and, and uh, it was a rite of passage for me as a writer when I thought, you know, this is fantastic. This is not, I'm so pleased and proud that my play and my book is, is a story of a woman. It's a story of a woman who goes through an immense crisis and soul-searching um, uh, adventure um, and it's more than me. It's a it's a story that other people can identify with, and that you embodied so so beautifully, and embodied all all forty characters. That is a hard job. You did a magnificent job. Well, so thank you. These words <laughs> mean a great deal. But I know this is going to sound like such a mutual. Well, it is a mutual admiration society. It is. Um, but good lord, you wrote such specific people with such great humor. By the way, everyone. You know, <laughs> what Alice went through for real, she was still able to find humor here, there, and everywhere. And uh, that was really delightful to work on as well. And the same thing is true here for uh, the year my mother came back, which is the show that everyone's going to be seeing next week. That is, as you say, adapted from your other memoir. I'm sorry, do you have more than, have you written more than two memoirs? I don't want no, to- No, I've, I've written the two memoirs. And, and I would say that the year- my mother came back is both a sequel to what I thought I knew and a prequel because it's, yeah. it's set, it's set during a year uh, about nine or 10 years after what I thought I knew is set, but it also time travels. So it goes way back in right. time. Um, and because you know, we'll talk, we'll talk about this, I'm sure, <laughs> this evening, but until, oh, around the middle of December, the idea, the plan was for you to remount what I thought I knew in a, uh, in a condensed version of the play, that I, a one-hour version that I'd written. Yes. Um, and that was the plan all year long, and that was something we, we had under our belt. We knew we could kind of pull that out and you can give the details, but it was a, a last minute um, discovery that we couldn't do that play. And I was asked to provide another play for you to direct, which is why I wrote the adaptation of The Year My Mother Came Back in exactly two weeks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I didn't know that. 
So for our viewing audience, um, I was, yes, lucky enough to be asked to come back with the, um, the hour long adaptation of what I thought I knew that was going to be called An Unexpected Life. And it's basically, if all of you saw what I thought I knew, or any of you saw that, it was the same absolute story, but you know, um, maybe a few char a few other characters weren't there, you know, just to get it within the hour. And, you know, I, I know there are a lot of actors out there who, when they leave a play, they can remember lines from high school to college to, what well, not me. Uh, I was gonna have to pick that up and go through it again. Probably it would have come faster, but still, I needed to really start working on that again, you know, by September, October. But what was happening with my union, because I'm a member of Actors Equity Association, their very strict protocol for COVID did not allow me to go forward in the Jewish Repertory Theater. And I'm not the only one. I mean, this is happening throughout the nation. So we kept waiting to see if things would lift or this would change or that would change. Finally, I said, I, you know, I've got to get working on it right now or I can't do it and, and do it well and do it the way it should be done, filmed in the theater, presenting it as still a theatrical experience uh, and telling the story with all the characters and all of that, which, by the way, again, your writing of those characters were so well defined. It was such a playground. So I thank you for your kind words. But without the specificity of your writing, I'm telling you, it would not have, it would not have been easy. And what wasn't necessarily easy anyway, but it was a, a real roll up your sleeves, you know, creative uh, thing that I had to do, which was great. So thank you. So I said to Jordana Halpern, our managing director, you know, we're getting really tight. Uh, we, we keep waiting to hear from them. If they give me a go ahead, you know, three weeks before we run a film, I'm going to be in trouble. Why don't I direct something? And let me tell you, usually when you start directing at any theater, you sort of have to have not only relationships, but, you know, just a sort of evolution, if you will, under your belt of, you know, having directed here, there and everywhere, which I had. I'm also a professor at Niagara University and I direct, you know, in acting classes and I also directed a play there last year, virtual. But Jordana was so amazingly open as was Saul Elkin, our artistic director, that it was a big go ahead, yes. And I didn't know this, but that's when they went back to Alice and said, what else you got? And when we, when this was proposed, I thought you had written this, Alice. Like, I thought you had it. I thought you wrote it. It's been in your coffers, if you will. I didn't realize how quickly you adapted this into a theatrical piece until you emailed me and said, I never wrote a play so fast in my life. I was like, what? <laughs> this is true. I, I have, um, in the last, oh, I've been working for, six months on a brand new play, but it takes me usually a very long time to write plays. So back to my props. It took me two years to adapt oh, sure. what I thought I knew. Oh, yeah. I learned a lot in the adaptation process because I worked on it for six months and I thought, it's finished. Now I'll read it out loud to myself and and just confirmed that it's done. Well, it took four hours to read out loud. And I thought, nope, back to the drawing board because a solo play cannot be four hours. So I knew more when I started to adapt the year my mother came back. Yes. I knew more about the importance of when you adapt a work of literature, whether it's something you've written yourself or, or another work of literature, mm. you must strip away and strip away and cut to the core, cut to the heart of the story. Mm. And so um, the year my mother came back, I it took me several years to write the memoir, but I knew the story well. And when Jordana asked me to, <laughs> she said, we would love, you know, we we're sorry we can't do what I thought I knew or the the uh, condensed version of that. We would love to do another one of your plays with Josie directing. What have you got? And I said, well, I have Oklahoma Samovar, which has Jewish content and it's two hours long with a cast of six. And she went, mm, no, it's got to be one or two actors and it's got to be like an hour, hour and a half. So I went through everything I have ever written and I had Jewish plays that were too short, Jewish plays that were too long, plays that were for one or two characters that didn't have any Jewish content. <laughs> and I, I really, I went through like everything in my entire repertory. And then I thought, I'm gonna write something new. Mm -hmm. And I have been meaning to write, to begin work on an adaptation of 
the year my mother came back for quite a while. And a director who's a frequent collaborative collaborator of mine um, who teaches directing at University of Michigan has been asking me repeatedly, when are you going to adapt the year my mother came back? Mm -hmm. And I keep, you know, telling her it's on its way. It's on its way. I haven't had time. So in mid-December, when Jordana said, what else have you got? I said, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. And I just dove in and literally have never written so fast in my life and um, wrote this very rough draft. The first draft, of course, was a very rough draft of a full length play, sent it to her. She and Saul looked at it and said, it's a go. And uh, when will your final draft be ready? I thought, is a final, is there really any such thing as a final draft? Of I, play? <laughs> it, I think maybe, uh, I, as far as I'm concerned, plays are always works in progress and they yes, change yeah. every time they're performed. But sure. this was certainly ready for rehearsal. And it just, it's been kind of a whirlwind and it's been thrilling and uh, only a little bit terrifying, but <laughs> mostly thrilling. And you, you know, I, I, you so, you know, I trust you so much. Oh. I trust you artistically and I trust you personally. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, you've, you've already done this deep dive into yeah. the way I think and talk and right. what my family relationships are and how I fictionalize to a certain extent or, or turn those relationships and characters into characters for the stage. So I totally trust your instincts and your intuition oh, and well, again, uh, I mean, thank you I truly you know um we don't want to get too saccharine out there but it's true <laughs> <We> <laughs> it so much. and what I what I loved about this process is I've only been in world premiere plays as an actor um but I had I had the the great fortune of working with um two other playwrights uh um where you know, as an actor, we get these, we're creating these roles for the very first time as far as acting them and fleshing them out. Of course, the writer's creating them as they're writing them. And I've never been able to work this way as director, uh, you know, with the playwright. And what was so great about Alice, everybody, is uh, Alice, you, you came to me and said, any thoughts? Any thoughts about cutting things out or do we need something here? Or what do you think about this scene? And I was so honored to even be asked that because as an actor, we get the script, we got to go for it. Now in film and TV, that is a little different. It's interesting. Uh, things can change in the moment, but film and TV scripts, normally speaking, TV is written in eight days or two weeks, film maybe a year or two, but even once you're there on the day, things still change in a way, you know, location, whatever's going on, that they'll change lines right on the spot. Theater, you get a script, you're, that's it. And as an actor, you must champion the writer, period. If you don't, if it feels clunky in your mouth or you can't relate to it, or you're not sure, it's your homework that you have to do. And you've got to make those words work. You can't go in and willy nilly change it because you feel better saying this, you know. Um, and in your case, it was very interesting to be asked that because I never experienced it as an actor, but as a director helping mount this, um, it was fascinating and thrilling to follow my own instincts as a performer and an actor, the way we do when we deal with script, that maybe we'd want to if we had the playwright in front of us and say, gee, you know, why don't you take this out or put this in? But I was able to do that with you and you trusted me enough to ask that. That was actually surprising until I found out that that is pretty much, would you say how it works with, because you've worked with other directors, that's how it works with playwright and director of a new Peace. Yes, it's in a development process of a new work. Um, yeah. the, the playwright is very much in, in collaborating with the director and um, making changes at rehearsals and changes between rehearsals. The, the um, very unusual thing about this is that we didn't know until we started that this was a development process of a, of a new play. So it's a stark contrast to last year where, as you mentioned before, I flew in for the for the opening yes. night, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even have a conversation with you or Saul before it. Um, yeah. I just. I saw the the, the finished product, 
And I was with you at the first rehearsal. I was yeah for this uh, one. Yeah. for this one. Um, I wasn't at all of the rehearsals, but I I was there. And there's the, the you know the the new reality of of theater is that much of it is on Zoom. So many of the rehearsals were on on Zoom. Right. And uh, I so look forward to seeing the, the yeah. filmed version of it because even when you moved into the, the theater at that point, my point of view was from your computer sitting in a back row, looking you know, at, the, at the wide, <laughs> right. and, the and wide so angle you view. You've done a lot of zooming. You <laughs> know the depth of field is bizarre. Like, I mean, even my next room in here looks like it's big, you know, when you were, when, when you zoom in, yeah, everybody can notice it's almost like a fish lens sort of depth of field. Yeah. So things in front, like, like you could huge my hands look, you know? So when Alice was watching this from a table in the theater, it made the Jewish repertory theater look like a football field, you know, at some point it was like, whoa. So you didn't get the, the advantage of that molecular change that happens in a theater when everybody's there yeah. live. And for the actors, by the way, I want to kind of do a commercial break here because I want to mention Tina Rauza and Jen Stafford, who uh, play, Jen Stafford plays Alice, you, well, Alice, the character. And Alice, the character. <laughs> plays Louise, the mother of the character of Alice. And I, I want to dive into that a little more in a minute, but I do want to say that what they had to do and adapt from... Zoom rehearsing to book in hand rehearsals to book in hand performances live to tape as we taped it without stopping like a film was asking them. I mean, I, I want you all to know the mountain they climbed. It was heroic and amazing. And uh, everybody was firing on all cylinders emotionally, uh, intellectually and everything in between. Um, but and I am so grateful to these wonderful actors and yeah, to the designers and the filmmakers. I'm so grateful to um, all of the artistry that's gone into this um, this new play. Um, do, should we talk a little bit about the play without? Um, well, I was going to. I was literally just going to see where did see Patty go. I was literally just going to ask you. Um, I realized the viewers might be wondering what the heck is this one about. So if you would, if you'd like to. Uh, you know, comment. Um, sure. I, think, I mean, there aren't too many spoilers, uh, really, because we kind of find out what's going on in the second page, but up to you. Take away. Yes. So um, I'm going to go back a few years to when I first started writing the memoir. I didn't know what my memoir was about. It was about this crazy year in my life where there were immense challenges. And uh, one, one of these challenges had to do with a, a surprising eye condition I had. Um, and I called my work in progress, my left eye. I showed it to my aforementioned friend, Kathy, who teaches theater at the University of Michigan and gave it to her as a first reader and asked her for feedback. And she said, I love it. But I'm sure you know this already, but this, has, this book is not about your left eye. This book is about your mother. And at first I wanted to protest and say, you don't know what my, and then I realized, of course it's about my mother. I just wasn't able to allow that to be the case. So my mother Wait, passed may I away. Ask why my, I'm going to guess why my left eye, I'm going to guess internally, but can you expand on why you wanted to call it that now that I know the story? Well, uh, this this is a a sidebar that we don't have to follow, but I had a I, I had an injury that caused um, blindness in my left eye. Besides that, yes, on top of everything else, and you know about the that it caused blindness that lasted for many months, and finally I finally recovered from that. Um, but I thought that that was the the core of the story, and my friend said, "Nah, I would remove, I would take out." all of the chapters about your left eye, save it for something else. That is not what this book is about. And at first I wanted to protest and say, no, 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 no. And then I realized she was right. My mother died when I was 22, right after I graduated from college. It was very, a very sudden 
um, an unexpected illness. And it, this, is, this is very much a, a part of the play, but um, I kind of put her out of my thoughts because it was too painful. So for 30 years, I just kind of intentionally or unconsciously stopped thinking about her. Of course, the subconscious never stops working. So of course she was there. But um, come along this, this year in my life when I was experiencing um, a medical diagnosis on top of some very intense and difficult challenges as a mother with both of my daughters. And the confluence of these challenges happening at the same time suddenly made my mother come back to me in a flood of memories. And by the way, the medical issue was not your left eye. It was yet something else again, something right. else in addition, which is amazing. I Yes. I, so the yeah, memories I think, start flooding back. Yes, 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 yes. So my mother came back in a flood of memories and having habituated myself to like suppressing those memories just to kind of get on with life, I didn't know what to do with it. I was feeling so vulnerable and realized ultimately I need my mother. Even though she's been dead for 30 years, I need her now. And what I needed to do was revisit the relationship, which had its wonderful and terrible times, but which I never had had a, an opportunity to reconcile um, because of her sudden death. It kind of ended in the, in the middle of unfinished business. And I, um, again, as you said, there aren't really spoilers. So that in the play and as in my life, I was diagnosed with breast cancer which my mother had had when she was um, a younger woman and that affected me growing up, her, um, her experience with it. So I identified with her, my experience of breast cancer um, gave me the opportunity to walk in her shoes, so to speak, and to uh, kind of understand her, even though in the play, in my memoir and in my own mind, my relationship with her was to a great extent fantasy. It was imagined dialogues, imagined um, uh, interactions with her and vivid, profoundly vivid memories. Um, the way you have staged the play so beautifully, I would say it kind of, um, it's both a ghost story and a love story. She's there and she's not there. Louise, the mother, is a is a very real character. Oh, she's I in there. Her. She is <laughs> such a real character. But she's been dead for 30 years. So mm -hmm. it's I think it's up to the audience to um, to kind of receive and interpret as they will. Is she there? Is she Alice's fantasy? Um, and I just think that's that you've posed those questions, um, those kind of theatrical questions and theatrical devices very beautifully. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear you say that. I mean, thank you for that very much. Uh, it's, um, I, I love that that's actually quoted directly from the play. She's there and yet she's not there. And uh, I feel like anyone, whether it's about our own mother or father, brother, sister, boyfriend, lover, husband, wife, you know, whatever, cousin, best friend, that there, there are so many conversations we have with ourselves as though they're there. We all do it. We all must do it. And um, how much of that is true that they might really be there? And you do it in a way which is really interesting to me where it's it's not, even though, you know, the, the character is Jewish and she goes through, you know, she talks about Yom Kippur and the different prayers and this and that here and there, that it still is not though, uh, how, would I, how do I put this? not only specific to a certain group, we all can relate to what really happens when someone is gone, who you don't get a chance to talk to or reconcile or, you know, have any compassion for or walk in their shoes or you love them at one time and all the questions or the things you want to say, you know, it's really encapsulated. And I love what you said earlier about um, with what I thought I knew 
um, condensing it into an unexpected life and taking out the things that don't just heed right to the story. Um, I was ready to do the whole thing again because I actually fell in love with some of the characters that you decided to take out for an unexpected yeah. life. But I believe you're right about it though. I do. Um, I would love to see a play about you teaching these classes because that's what some of those characters were, the, the students that you had as a, a solo artist teacher. And they were delight. They were wonderful. They were fun to play. But I see what you're saying, and I believe you did that with this play. Very, and in, in, you know, in spades. It, uh, it's really, it really takes us from this full year of what this woman, this woman knew, but Alice, the character, goes through, and uh, we can really follow the thread. I feel, you know. So this, the, um, the book, when you when you write prose, when you write a book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, there's really no limit to the number of pages. There's no limit to, uh, sure. you know, you can do as much um, reflective narrative as you want. Uh, interior monologue can go on forever. Description can go on forever. Yeah. In theater, that's unnecessary. And, and I mean, I actually love monologue and, and uh, interior monologue. And uh, I do think there's, there's an important place for that in right in plays and in my plays, but I, I clearly made an intentional choice to, to cut much, many, many characters. There are many characters in the book, and this is really a play about these two characters, the mother and, and the daughter, at different ages in their lives. Um, and because the actors and the designers have so beautifully evoked the numerous places and time periods that are alluded to in the play, um, much of the description could be cut as well. Um, so there, there's a lot of kind of compressed storytelling that goes yeah. on in a play because it's not, you know, when you read a book, it's a relationship between the reader and the words on the page. That is the relationship. Yes. And when you're watching a play, whether it's in a live audience or in this case, a film of um, the production, it's a relationship between a collective audience and a collective group of artists, the playwright, the designers, the actors, the director, there are real bodies on the stage who are interpreting and breathing and uh, um, you know, kind of sharing, sharing a space together. And it's, it, there's so much going on already Right. That um, compressing the storytelling verbally uh, is is a necessity and a um, uh, just a, a one of the joys of of writing plays. I, I love I love what you're saying because with books, as you say, you and I can read the same exact book and have so many. You know, we'll get the same story. But our visuals and our interpretation of it and our feeling about it and all that is ours. And that's why book readers love books so much, because it's, it's an internal journey and all of that. Yes, when we are collaborating, that's exactly why theater is so amazing uh, in terms of education, whether someone ends up becoming a banker or, you know, a, a scientist or in medicine or anything else. But if they are able to experience theater at a young age or through school or community theater as an adult, they start to understand this gorgeous, wonderful collaboration of different human beings, all telling the same story. And in a way, there's, there's a real let go that you have to experience of, well, I would light it this way, or I would want this design that way, or I would direct it that way, or I would act it that way. But everybody's got their job and we all make room for each other to uh, flush that out. And it's really fun. This team, by the way, we were all on the same page from the get-go. Yeah. They, were, they were, again, it's true. They were inspired by this story. It's a beautiful story. We had some of the guys, I think it's kind of funny, um, uh, who were coming in just to do sound and camera, say that all their files, they, they didn't know the name of it. So all of their files were <laughs> named Breast Cancer 1, Breast Cancer 2, <laughs> Breast Cancer Play. But, but I heard a couple of them, like within earshot, they weren't talking to me at all, say, this is such a good story. I was like. And would you agree, it is not a play about breast cancer. It's a play right. about, it's a, play about a relationship. No, it's a play about it's a relationship between a mother and a daughter. 
at different ages and about um, about forgiveness and reconciliation. Yeah. And that's why I think they they were relating. Yeah. It's like anybody can relate about anything if it's well done and it really shows a certain relationship. What do they say that, you know, uh, the the what you want out of art is to be able to see yourself up there, whether it's in a painting or in a song or theater, film, dance, all of that. And uh, I, I think in this case, you know, people can lean in and really start to think about things in their own lives because someone had once said that the more specific you are as an artist, the more universal it is. And, and I, I love that. And I think that's very true. Um, I did, God, God is in the details, they say, yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> about, yeah. about writing and art making. And also, I just want to say very quickly to go back to Jen Stafford, who plays Alice and Tina Rousey, who plays um, uh, Louise, that um, a lot was asked of them in a very little amount of time, as I said. But I'm discovering something ever since last March, when we had to go virtual for school, teaching, acting online. And then I did an online production uh, once again, uh, uh, an original written by Donna Hoke, uh, who is an incredible writer, uh, international. She happens to reside in Buffalo. And I, have, I had the great <laughs> fortune to meet her yes. last year when I was in Buffalo. Yes. And uh, yeah, and, and I love that too, because now I've, now I've sort of gotten the different, you know, uh, sides of working with uh, a play that's being, you know, written from the ground up. And, um, but being an actor in that, where it was a reading, but it was on Zoom. So we actually could look at our lines on a split screen and still look into the camera or look over here or look over there, wherever we had to look. Whereas Jen and Tina needed to hold their book in hand live on the stage while we were filming them. And here's a plug for a very deserved plug for Full Circle Studios, Terry Fisher and his crew who came in to film it with three different cameras. And I got to then go between theater and filming directing, you know, it, it was such a hybrid of things. And I think everyone knew we couldn't navel gaze. Do you know what I mean? We had to just do it. And in the doing, a lot of collaboration came onto the same page. We knew we were under the gun time-wise, but nobody felt like rushed or that we were acquiescing just to get it done. It was, it was an incredible, uh, you know, um, playground, if you will, uh, of professionals who really knew they had to get this done. And, and I want I wanted to just say how grateful I am to the JRT for creating this model. I think there are a lot of um, theaters that are coping in various ways with uh, what it means to do um, theater when you can't have, <laughs> when yeah. you're so being socially distanced. And I, and I love the JRT's approach to it. Yeah. Um, safe, socially distanced yeah. theater making that is beautifully filmed with a professional three camera video company. And that creates a, a multi-dimensional um, theater experience for, for audiences who can watch it safely from home. So again, my, my love affair with JRT <laughs> continues. <laughs> I'm so honored and, and pleased to be a part of this this season and and so thrilled to be sharing oh, this experience with you. Well, this is like, yeah, I want to want to keep doing I want to keep doing more. It's just fun. Um, but I did want to say very quickly that um, for those of you who aren't maybe aware of all the different sort of modalities, if you will, that theaters are taking, there is now a good five or six different sorts of modalities or formats, if you will that are being asked of actors. It used to be, oh, you're stage or you're in front of the camera, whether it's TV or film, but it's stage, camera. Now there's Zoom acting. I don't know if somebody's already coined it as Zoom acting, I don't know. <laughs> but then there's also um, acting on stage that's being filmed where everybody's off book and you're doing it as though people are there in the seats, but they're not, but it's being filmed. And then there's the staged reading and then the staged reading that's being filmed. And I think the staged reading is a very ambitious and uh, challenging uh, uh, art form, if you will. But once it's realized and once it's done, it's so rewarding because it isn't just that you're re rehearsing with a book in your hand. And in rehearsals, we know it's a rehearsal and we know we can you know, screw up, if you will, or be on the wrong page or whatever. 
But when you have it in hand and you're so invested the way Jen Stafford and Tina Rousa were, and but they still have to go back to the lines because it's not memorized, they were, believe you me, thinking on their feet. And I just realized as a director that this is the new world that we're in. And I think we're gonna see more of this, not just with JRT, but a lot of theaters until we can all feel really safely back in our seats. And maybe it won't ever end. Maybe there'll be different kinds of virtual productions that come up because of the blessing in disguise, if you will, very horrible disguise. Um, for instance, in An Unexpected Life, because of social distancing, there's a moment when Tina, as the mother, would touch Alice as her daughter. But she, the, the year my mother came back. I, I'm sorry, what did I say? What I thought I knew? One of those titles. <laughs> and the year my mother came back, sorry. In that one, they had to be distanced. Or she might reach out for her and they don't really hold hands. And I kind of love that anyway. I think there's a real power in that anyway, with nothing to do with social distancing. I agree. But age this next year, I might very well do a lot of the same things because of what came from not being able to touch. It was just a very fascinating thing. Anyway, I want uh, the, the, um, our viewers, our, our friends out there to know what's next for you, may I ask? What you got? Oh, going? gosh. Um, well, I am working on a new play called, uh, called um, Hotel Limbo. And I, I live in New York City in the Hotel Belle Claire, which is a beautiful landmark building. I've lived here for a really long time. And I have a rent stabilized apartment, which means I, I don't, you will be jealous if I tell you what I pay. So I'm not going to tell you. Uh, oh, um, but I at, at the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, the building, which was most, has become mostly a commercial hotel with a small number of residential hotel dwellers, um, the, we found out on May 3rd, Sunday afternoon, May 3rd, with no warning that the hotel was being transformed into a homeless shelter um, to comply with the New York City's um, initiative to move homeless individuals out of overcrowded homeless shelters into city hotels to reduce the spread of to reduce the spread of COVID. So at first I was alarmed and worried. And I'm gonna jump to the chase here. I have grown to love living in the building now that it is a homeless shelter. My neighbors are beautiful. The security yeah. guards are incredibly friendly. Um, it is I, it feels like as safe a building as there can be during COVID because there's so much care that everyone is uh, mm. taking with each other and for each other. There is, however, uh, there has been a huge amount of hostility from homeowners in the neighborhood mm. who wanted to get our new neighbors out of the neighborhood. So I have been politically involved as a kind of activist um, advocating for the um, for our new our new neighbors, and I've been writing this play, um, which looks at my long uh, time living in the hotel, about the hundred plus year history of the hotel, which started out as a luxury hotel in 1904, um, and then went into a period of decline, and has seen these crazy shifts in fortune, and it's um, it's a it's a I'm finding the project. Uh, to be really engaging, and I'm I'm developing it with Ensemble Studio Theater Playwrights Unit that that I'm a part of. So that's been exciting. Um, wow. the, the play <laughs> I mentioned before, Oklahoma Samovar, is going to be on a national virtual tour uh, with the Jewish Plays Project. That's going to be this spring, and I'm I'm so excited about that. I just absolutely thrilled to be um, collaborating with the Jewish Plays Project. This is this is a, a real Jewish playwriting time for me. <laughs> wow. Hey, um, I ask, are they going to be readings or literally performed? Are they getting- the There will be um, Zoom. There are 10 finalists mm -hmm. in this, the 10th National Jewish Play Contest. And each of the finalists, so they, they 
introduced us to each other. We had a wonderful Zoom party together. So there's not, not a sense of competition, just a sense of collaboration. We've each been asked to um, come up with a 15 minute excerpt and they are going to hire actors and directors to direct Zoom performances of these 15 minute excerpts. And those excerpts are going to be presented at various cities around the country uh, where participating um, theaters and um, Jewish community centers, et cetera, will be watching and selecting their own um, contest winners. So anyway, I'm thrilled to be a part of that. I'm teaching, I just, right, right before this, I was teaching my playwriting class at the New School University um, on Zoom, of course, yeah. And yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a busy time. This has been a highlight for me. And just as last year's production with the JRT was a highlight for me. And I'm so, it's so much fun to talk to you. And I'm just checking the clock. And I think our time is up. It is, it is time for us to open this up to yes. questions from um, anybody in the audience. But Josie, what a pleasure to hang oh, out on you. Zoom with you. <laughs> All of you have just been privy to, you know, listen to the conversation. So uh, we have, is it, we have a question. Is it difficult or challenging? Ah, this is a great one. Uh, is it difficult or challenging sharing such personal experiences about your life with your audience? If time heals a lot of things. So if, this were, if there weren't some years in between the experience and the performance, I think the answer would be yes, it would be terribly difficult. Mm. But because um, I guess uh, the year my mother came back is set 11 years ago. And also my, you know, m most of my lifetime ago, it kind of covers my entire, yeah. <laughs> entire life from childhood till uh, 10 years ago. Um, because there's that time in between, I feel very comfortable. I feel uh, like I'm I'm honored to share the story. I um, the the book got well, both of the the memoirs got positive feedback, and I was I got the sense from from readers that they really appreciated my honestly talking about these complex emotions and sharing difficult stories and. Um, you know, rich, richly layered stories. And, and so I feel confident that these are stories that, um, or I hope that these are stories that people will identify with and, and, and feel touched by. And so, no, I would say it's not. not well, difficult. also, if I might just throw something in there, a, a really fun, wonderful little anecdote. When I was in um, what I thought I knew and had to play Alice's husband, Michael, uh, I would never met him. I didn't know. And like I said, you know, we just had to create these characters out of my imagination and, and the great writing that it was given to me to, you know, the specifics. And I gave, because he's from New Orleans, I didn't give him a typical New Orleans accent. I actually looked up what other accents could be like. And I was kind of thinking of the kind of accent I'd want to, you know, emulate, if you will, not copy, but just kind of have it in, you know, the the uh, in my tongue a little bit, so I, I sort of did a watered down Bill Clinton. <laughs> I remember you had asked me about that, and I told you, and you went back to Michael, and he goes, "Yeah, I'm okay with that. <laughs> totally okay with that." He's it's become kind right. of a running running joke. We love it. <laughs> and you, you had to right, I would and you had to sit there and watch someone you you know an actor you've never met before portray your children and your husband or whatever. So. Um, yeah, but so, so relevant to that, here's a question for you, Josie. How did it feel to direct a character you had already played? Mm. I will say I was really happy to have let go of my own voice with that. In other words, it would have been easy to go, oh, you know, I would have done it this way because I played it. But maybe because it's in a completely different place and time for Alice, and I have the good fortune of being a professor and an acting coach, so I see so many different actors come through my path that I sort of just automatically, I, 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 I just, it was automatic to allow Jen to find what she was finding. And she's so wonderful that I was getting a kick out of the things she was finding. So it, it was okay to do, you know, it was okay to, to, to you know, transfer that over. 
my voice into someone else portraying it. Yeah. Do we have another? Oh, got a couple more questions. Ah, what future plans do you have with this play? I don't know yet. I have no idea because it is so uh, brand new. I, I don't have plans yet. Um, yeah, I want, I want to take it on the road. But anyway, um, and <laughs> that's my plan too. take it on the road with you. <laughs> oh, I love that. All right. Um, and someone actually just asked, but you just asked me, how did it feel to direct a character you'd already played? Yeah, well, I'll tell you the other thing about that, though, is that I'm, I'm a person who compartmentalizes. I've always been this way. And I became a director. So I was a director. I wasn't sitting there as an actor thinking I would do it this way. It was more about I had a job to do. So that said, I also had dug into the character of Alice from pretty much July of the year before until we went into rehearsals the next January. And so in directing it, I did feel like I had a leg up on the sensibility of the play in general, the sensibility of Alice, your humor, Alice, the way you write. I already was so at home with it that I think that that helped any nerves I might've had as a director. You know, um, I sort of, like I said, I had a leg up. I, I was already familiar with the world of it. So, so I felt good about that, about having, you know, that at my disposal after playing Alice myself. That was important to me also going into this. Again, as I said at the beginning of our conversation this evening, I, I trusted you with the material, with the characters. Wow. I knew that you had already um, studied <laughs> the voice and the characters in, in, yeah. in a bunch of different ways. But you know what's really fun too is um, as an actor, it'd be so easy to see someone else either do the, the same role you've done. I mean, a lot of people play a lot of the same roles through the years, right? You might go to a theater and see someone do something you just did last year or whatever, but also a different iteration of the character. Uh, it was fun for me to yeah. there and help call, you know, other parts of her life. Uh, so yeah, do we have any, do we have any other questions? Because we're not literally looking at the link. Um, I want to see if there's anything else I wanted to ask you, Alice. I had little notes. I love that you say it's the sequel and prequel because you're right. In the year my mother came back, you begin by talking to your audience at 53 years old. And then we visit you all the way back to when you're five, you know, different ages, back to the present. There are dreams, there are memories. Uh, and yet it's, it feels like a linear story because all this is happening as you're going through the experience with dealing with your cancer. So it's really interesting how it's a linear story. In but it, it time travels. Time, right. But yet we're going, you know, here, there and everywhere. So that was fun. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I think I, I will, you know, uh, button it up with because I do think we're probably done now with um, yeah with just saying once again to reiterate what Alice said about Jewish repertory theater from the very very beginning of the shutdown uh, they were their wheels were already turning about what they could do and what was wonderful is what they what they thought they knew what they thought they might have done in the beginning has evolved as well and taken such a beautiful evolution to what's going on here. Uh, their last two shows, Bar Mitzvah Boys and Holiday Shorts, really explored that whole bringing theater to your living room. And uh, I, hope, I hope the audiences will be just as happy with this one, because I know those other two were very successful. Well, I can't wait to see it. Um, and Me neither. I hope, I hope many audience members will, will also uh, come online and, and watch the play. And uh, this has been such a joy working with you again, Josie. Oh, my, go my goodness, Alice. You too. And thank you for being here. And thank you for your openness and your collaborative spirit and everyone watching in Jewish Repertory Theater, everybody. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you. Bye.